We love looking at plays. Let's do it today. Stick around. Greetings and welcome back to another episode of Five Play Friday, the show where we take a look at plays, look at all of the things, analyze game video, positioning of the crew, events that happen on the court, correct officials making the correct call, communication strategies, etc. all of the things so that we can get better. We're extracting the positive. We're identifying the negative and seeing how that relates to our game. Like, yeah, I do that as well. Greetings again, everybody. My name is Greg Austin with A Better Official. We craft video to help basketball officials get better and take control of their officiating career. Allow me a moment to thank our tremendous show supporters who fuel our broadcast. Janice Brown, Jeff Jewett, Gary Mouton, Ashton Dillon, and Richard Hill. Much appreciated and much love. You want to support the show, you can always buy us a coffee. I'll put a link above and in the show notes below. All right, today we are looking at viewer submitted plays, right? If you want to submit a play, you can always send it to a link in the show notes, a betterofficial.com slash submit plays. It's on the screen here as well. And we can take a look at your game video, add it to the show, right? Make the show better join in. Appreciate that. All right, let's take a look at our very first play. Block charge play under the basket. What do we have on this play, right? So a lot of, you know, energy from outside of the game, from the stakeholders in the game. You can't take a charge under the basket, right? Because at other levels, there's a restricted area that prevents this. But the, in, fundamentally, that does not exist in National Federation of High School Basketball rules. It does exist in Minnesota, but not in National Federation of High School Basketball rules. So... Get out the way, ref. Let's first of all judge the legality of the defender and then the subsequent actions on the play, right? There's a lot going on here on this play and we need to first of all identify all of the things and then we're gonna look at the habits and fundamentals of the officials. Right, so we got a player who does a chin up on the bar, subsequent clapping between the two players involved. This player defender is legal by rule. We have a pull-ups, you know, right, where the player pulls up, right? This is a tactical foul almost always. Now, if there was a player who was running in underneath him and he's, you know, pulling up in an effort to avoid that player who was, you know, like at his legs, etc., sometimes that can happen. That may be something different. And then afterward, we've got the clapping point you know basically a directional vocalization as well on the play I'm gonna go there right our calling official seems to do a pretty good job at the spot of the foul right notice that they put their hand up in in an F, in a fashion that potentially obscures no it doesn't it doesn't right but they are not, they are not op maybe as open to the play as they could be. So this is a charge. We should have a player technical here. And we certainly have to address this situation between the two players, right? The, 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 the offending player on that, right? Let's go there. So there's a lot in this play. If we look at the center official here, right? Because when we analyze our game video, we're always looking at habits and fundamentals, 
right? We didn't see something. We didn't perceive something. Why didn't we perceive? Almost always, it's going to be because we're not in the best position to to perceive those situation, right? So let's watch our center official here. And their initial reaction is to disconnect and turn. Head stayed back for a moment, but they're not, right? What we want here is, right, we have a call, is freeze. Freeze vision right here, right? And be aware of all the things, right? That's what we want. That's almost the key takeaway here on this play. So a block charge play to get us started. We have the situation where the player is literally, almost literally, under the basket, right? And this this becomes a thing. Like you will talk, you will work with partners who will say, no way I'm calling that a charge, right? Players can't stand under the basket. we got to realize that we, we have our rule set, right? Our rule set says that player can absolutely set up to take a charge there. So this is a charge by rule. If you want to manage your way out of that, uh, et cetera, and we have to be aware that, pers- that uh, energy will come from the stakeholders in the game. The, op- the offended coach on this play is going to say, you cannot call a charge. He was right under the basket, right? Right, because he just watched that collegiate game where they have the restricted area, and this would be, you know, this would be a block or an RA block in that situation. But it's high school coach. It's what we've got. It's what we've got. Oi, oi, oi! Right. So I think we're uh, like early second period here as well, because because obviously in any situation, um, we. the game has occurred to this point, and we're going to have the rest of the game. If we have this situation early in the game, we have to address it. I mean, what's going to happen if we don't? There's going to be more and more and more, and it makes it harder for us as officials, right? So we just have to address this. In e- even in this situation, if uh, addressing it means, all right, hey partner, you know, uh, hey, ca- uh, you know, no crosstalk, or we're just going to talk our ways out of the situation. Don't do, you know, the stern warning. Don't do that anymore, etc. <laughs> That's an option as well. Yeah. So, what if the ball was already in the basket when the contact occurs? It's pretty close, right? Airborne player, right? Even after they release the ball, even after it's in the goal. If there is a charge on a play, no goal can be scored, right? Important to remember that. Definitely a chin up, right? So like I say, if we had that play, if we had a defender who was sliding in underneath them and they pull up to uh, avoid that player, that's something different, right? Because then they are protecting themselves. And you could certainly get that situation where if I I allow myself to swing, I'm going to contact somebody down below. Right. But in this instance, it is just part of the movement. Right. It's part of the thing that says I am the strong one. Um, Right. But to me, the taunting just absolutely has to be addressed here. Right. And it's a two way street. It's not like, you know, one player is uh, by themselves here. Right. And we may, who knows what has occurred in this game. We may have had a situation where the players were, there was a lot of crosstalk in this game. Right. If that's the, it makes our job so much harder if we allow that. Now, we love competition. We love a competitive atmosphere, but we love sportsmanship and, you know, playing within the restrictions that, that players have. And there, you know, the you always appreciate when a player has the ability to convey the energy of, you know, the, the same energy, but do it within the guidelines. Unfortunately, you know, we have this sort of AAU culture. You watch an AAU highlight video, right? It's almost like it's implied that if you dunk on somebody, you must then turn to them and, you know, make a statement or mean mug or do something. 
it's 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 almost implied that that is proper behavior, right? And so that carries over into the high school game. It's something we just absolutely have to deal with. Key takeaway, when we analyze game video, we can say, oh, this crew did these things wrong, right? They should have done this. They Their judgment on this was poor, et cetera, right? What we can extract is just identifying that there was a habit displayed that I need. If I'm the center official on this game, I have to have that subsequent action. I have to have that player hanging on the rim. I have to have the subsequent action between the players. I can't disengage, right, and not officiate the game. We have a long way to go in this game, right? And if we don't address things, we are setting ourselves up for disappointment. So a good block charge play to get us started today. Let's now take a look at play number two. Right, so Jason Hayes contributes this play. We have a rebounding situation, players competing for the basketball. I think one player actually takes the ball away from the other. A foul is ruled. The players then, during dead ball, go at each other. And we have tactical fouls on each of them in this situation. Note we have the visiting coach uh, or an assistant coach, somebody coming onto the court, getting their problem player. Obviously a situation where a fight may break out, legal, 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 probably escorts them to the bench, which presents a conundrum as well. Our crew gets together and reports what they have, right? And we would need to, uh, to in that meeting, to have decided what is going to happen next, right? Who is the foul on? Uh, was it a player control foul? Was it a defensive foul? What is going to be the adjudication after that? And then we have one official going to one coach and potentially the other official going to another, talk them down, explain the situation, etc. These are all the things we want to look at. Right, so we've got an initial push and then a subsequent retaliatory push. If we had just the initial push, would we have a double technical in that situation? Something to look at. On that play. I'll tell you something I really want to highlight here. And Jason says, you know, let me uh, give it to me. Watch the body language of the center official. Right? Blows a whistle and inserts this body into the situation. There's no grabbing of players, pushing of players, like with the arms, just using the body to create a space between our two participants in this situation, right? It keeps us safe, it keeps them safe, it keeps us free from liability. Absolutely critical to identify that. That should be our default situation, is to put our body between uh, high energy sit in a higher energy situation and not use our hands and our you know sometimes we'll use our arms like in an extended fashion but great great habit on this play one that you absolutely want to take and say that I need that habit I'm going to use that in my game in any similar situation right that's really critical takeaway and when we analyze game video what are we doing oh they did this wrong they did this wrong they did this wrong they did this wrong right? We're not, we're cheating ourselves if we do that, right? What are the positives? What are the things that, ooh, you see how we did that? I want to do that, 
right? I want to add that to my game. Take the positive. And when we're analyzing our own game video, right? I'm terrible. I'm terrible. I'm terrible. I'm really bad, right? No. You got to celebrate your successes. I did this really well. I did this really well. I, I should have done this here instead of that. I need to improve at that. You know, I've seen that in other plays as well. I need to focus on doing that in that situation. Here's an area for improvement. But you got to celebrate the things that we did well. Come on now. All right. Can't beat ourselves up. So our crew does a good job once our players are sent to the benches. Our crew does a good job of staying open and communicating about the play. This is exactly what we want. We've got to come out of here. Um, uh, the the uh, reporting official says that uh, we had some erroneous information, actually reported the wrong number on the foul. Um, but all the habits and techniques we're displaying here are positive for this. Now, we've got that player right? In this situation, we have this double tactical situation. Our players are supposed to stay on the court. Our, our coach came and got that player, took them to the bench, probably sat them down. Is that the best thing for the game? It absolutely is, right? Is this unauthorized leaving of the court? Or It's a dead ball, right? So uh, I'd say that's our best case scenario to get that player extracted from the game. I say there's a lot of positives here, right? We kind of let the players uh, naturally uh, move to their benches as opposed to directing. That's, a, that's something we could have improved on this play, is directing the players to their benches, ensuring they are going to their benches, ensuring that, there's, that they are separated completely right, um, prior to uh, having that conversation on the court. At the same time, there were really only two players here that were of, of concern. We didn't have multiple situations uh, you know, uh, players coming in and addressing opponents, etc. So the tension was really between the two. And once those two were um, moved, then we really solved 90% of the equation. But as a habit, we would want to uh, display that, ensure that our players are, are disconnected. Say, so let's take a look at play number three. Hmm. Right, so let's take a look at what we have on this play. Two person officiating. Primary defender. That player carried the basketball right there. That's pretty obvious carry. Goes to the basket. Block shot, body contact, rebound. Foul is ruled. Upgrade. Intentional foul is ruled on the play. Right? So, that player carried the basketball. There's no way that they're going to be able to move the ball from one side to the other like that on that play. That's our obvious miss on the violation, right? On the drive to the basket, right? Players driving, blocked up top, body contact. The defender certainly moves from A to B on this play if we watch them. Ignored that. Release the try. Official makes the call. Processing, 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 intentional. Right? Looks like the defender uh, extended an arm uh, on the player and probably gave them a little shove after the fact um, on this play. If we get this guy out of the way, maybe we can see a little better. So that's the ruling on the play, right? I'm gonna go report that. Penalty for an intentional foul here. We're gonna clear the lane. Two free throws to the offended player. Ball to the team at the spot nearest the foul. 
We don't have any real communication between the crew here that we could uh, obviously, you know, have some verbal communication. Hey, partner, I have intentional. Let's clear the lane. He'll shoot two. We'll go end line throw in right here, right? And everything's sort of time stamped in advance. Then we can go report. Then we can, you know, process. Oh, did I really make the right call there? <laughs> All the natural stuff. Talk to the coach who thinks, well, how can you go intentional there for that, right? Um, because we we don't have to think about what's going to happen next because we've worked it out at the spot, right? If we can build that habit in. It gives us a little freedom then to go communicate and not worry about how we're going to resume play. It's certainly not, it's not like he, you know, swung on arm and hit him in the head or anything like that. It was, you know, it's, it's more subtle. I think what we have is a sort of a, uh, you know, and we're, we're not here really to, to make a judgment about the play. The official had a really clear look at the play, right? If the player was off balance, causing them to lose their balance, if that same player was more balanced, right, maybe they, maybe they, they, they don't fall to the floor and we don't necessarily upgrade to intentional, right? These are all factors in our decision-making. Okay. All right, so ultimately, of course, the ball ends up in the basket on this play. So uh, something we would want to do is wipe that, make sure there's, there's no confusion that there is no goal scored on this. It was not part of the try. All right, let's take a look. on the rebound, right? So that's just a habit and fundamental. We'd want to make sure that there's no goal scored, just to emphasize that fact, or be aware of whether uh, points were put on, up on the board, etc. cetera. Right, a, a bit stuck at trail, comes in, processing, processing, intentional, spot of the foul, processing, maybe communicating with a partner there, I don't know. No hurry. Right, spot of the, if we've ruled an intentional foul, you know, everything disperses, but we just don't want to be in a hurry to, oh, I have an intentional foul. I'm going to turn and report. Hey, right, no eagerness there. That was good. Ah, so Jason jumps in. It was a two hand shove. White was down 35 at the time, right? Just brings up the excellent point that when we have a disparity in the score, we're looking for frustration from the, from the team that's being smoked, right? You know, it's natural. Uh, if there's any energy from the other team that's, you know, needling that team about, you know, we are kicking your ass, right? Something to that effect. Even if it's just subtle, we just need to have our antennas up, right? We have this, this score disparity how we handle things, right? We want to be super aware of any sort of taunting action, and we want to be super aware of any frustration action on in the game. Let's look at play number four. Right, so Jason has another play here. Player control foul, right? So a couple of years ago, a point of emphasis for National Federation of High School was uh, elbow contact above the head, right? And it was encouraged that it has to be at minimum an intentional foul, a possible flagrant, etc. There has since been clarification with case play that we can have when in this situation, we can have four possible outcomes. One, no call. Two, player control foul. Three, intentional foul. Four, flagrant foul. Those are the four options on the table. Our official here uh, at New Trail, right, identifies that this player has established their uh, elbows in a, in a legal position, 
but moves the elbow into an opponent, right? It actually catches, I think, sort of the fleshy part, and that's always a bit of a factor in our thinking about these plays, right? Fleshy part is an inconvenience. Bony part is possible uh, cut, right? And, you know, uh, more severe action. Right, so the initial action was to, you know, his coach is going to say, that's exactly what I trained him to do, right? He got his elbows up, but he turns. We have a player control foul. We've got spot of the foul mechanics by our calling official. And then our crew, then we have a bit of Keystone Cops going on, right? Every, we're, there's uncertainty about where we're supposed to be, et cetera. Um, that can happen. This Our mechanics in this situation are not... Uh, we don't get into this situation frequently. Let's put it that way. Right? Spot of the foul mechanics, right? Very strong. We get the initial, uh, uh, what do we have, a punch? Do we have a punch? <laughs> no, not the punch. We've got the foul. Punch or point. And then the up to the head all works really well, right? Again, a little bit of processing time, right? We have a foul, a little bit of processing time. Player control foul is the ruling. I agree with that ruling. We are midway through the second period. Team fouls nine and four. If we go with player control foul here for, uh, you know, it's simply a ball to the opponent at the spot nearest the foul. All right. So, a lot of positives to take on this. Our crew ends up a little distracted and uh, we're filling in. Of course, we're the only ones who know about mechanics, right? So we always have the opportunity to fill in um, if we have uncertainty. Calling official ends up uh, explaining to the coach, right? Not notice our body position. We're talking to the coach over the shoulder right? Which is a great way to communicate in this situation. Coach is like, he, I trained him to do that. I, I told him he's finally doing it, etc. Um, that's what we have on that play. Yes, John Lamb, elbows rotating approximately the same speed as the torso. Absolutely. That's the key thing to the equation, right? This is not the, right, get off me. And it wasn't a get off me. It was, I'm here and I turn and your head is there. It's a thing, right? We can always make uh, a judgment about a play. Just because we blow our whistle and raise our fist does not mean we have taken upgrade intentional or flagrant off of the table, right? We are giving, uh, sometimes we are going to um, get information as a crew, right? I, you know, the calling official has, a, has an elbow, uh, has a foul on a play, but a partner comes in and says, you know, that was excessive contact. We had that in just a couple episodes ago where, the, you know, there was something on that play that I saw that rises to the level of intentional foul, right? That's always on the table for the crew, the ability to upgrade or the official to put a, put a foul on the play, process, 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 and then say, here's my ruling on this play. That's an intentional foul by rule. That's a flagrant foul by rule, et cetera. That's always uh, our availability to do that. All right, let's look now at play number five.
Wow. Wow. So, submitted by Brett Temple, this play. <sighs> Game deciding situation, right? So, let's start by recognizing time and score. We're probably coming out of a timeout. 23 seconds left. Visitors down by two. Bonus situation, both sides, right? In the, if we're going into this end-of-game situation, we are doing all of the things. We have knowledge about all of the things, right? We had, we're going to know the impact of our whistle on the game. Throw in on the end line, right? Notice that the camera angle is super tight. As officials, we're like eager for more information off screen. Like what's happening off ball, right? Right, clock's winding down. Right, and here we are, right here. Right, this. Right, we know the game is. This is the game. Right, we want to be at our best right here. Once you get out the way, ref. Block charge play. Boom, charge. Right, emphatic, conviction, etc. One point three remaining. We have made the call at the key moment of the game. We need to judge the legality of our defender here. Right? This defender is coming from a long distance. If we notice our lead is focused on the ball handler here. It's always a challenge in this situation. We've got that player potentially in our primary in a two-person game, that defender from behind. I need to be able to see what happens from, from that defender from behind, but I have to transfer my eyes and pick up that next defender. And that's challenging. It's something we're constantly working on. I know for me personally, this season, at the start of the season, that's one of those things, the transferring of the eyes, a little out of shape, right? On this play, Defender slides over. Charge is ruled. Spot of the foul, strong, etc. Let's take a look at that defender and talk about the, the legality. That's obviously the key thing on this play. In order to be legal on this play, our defender has to be established on the floor prior to the player going airborne. This player does not have legal guarding position at this point. Right. That right foot. Yeah, let's do it on the slow-mo portion. It's really about that right foot getting down. Is the player airborne when they put when the right foot comes down? Boy, geez, Louise, that is as close as possible. As close as possible, right? And then after the right foot is down, then the body moves, continues to move over, etc. We are obviously thinking time and score here. There are so many variables on the table. This. You know, it's a, a full house, big game. You know, this is where you want to be. This is where you want to be your best, etc. But the ruling on the play is charge. One thing I will say, I love the demeanor of the official prior to the call, right? The body position is fantastic, relaxed in a position to make judgments, processing, making a decision, right? That's all we can do in that situation. All right, Brett, thanks for submitting that play. That's a good one. It's a close one. It's a banger. Lots going on, lots to think about in this situation. Let's put it that way. We can establish legal guarding position in an instant, which what this player would have to do to get that right foot down in an instant. Yeah, I think he's late. 
I think the right foot, even if you were saying making a judgment of the right foot, I think it's late. I think this is a block. That's my opinion on this play. My opinion also is this team is down by two. <laughs> That's also my opinion. <laughs> I'm going to leave that there. Right. And obviously, time and distance are factors when guarding an opponent without the ball. Right. Time and distance are relevant. Time and distance is relevant when screening a moving opponent. But, uh, you know, a key takeaway in terms of understanding legal guarding position on a player handling the ball is that it can be established in an instant. Right. The player um, uh, receives the ball. They are holding the ball. The defender establishes legal guarding position, and in a fraction of a second, even though it's like instantaneous, but boom, right? And there's contact. That defender had established legal legal guarding position. I'm not saying that that's what happened on that play, but that's the way legal guarding position works when defending a player with the ball. Sometimes it can really be bang bang, and that's why we get paid the big bucks. That is why we get paid the big bucks. So that's a banger. That's a game deciding call. It's you know the environment seems super intense. It's fantastic. It's it's where we want to be. We want to be as officials making that call and be and feeling confident in our call and getting the call right. Right? If we're a lower level official, we're working up towards being a higher level official. If we're a higher level official, we're working up to working the big games, the important games, the playoff games. The state finals, the, all the things, right? And we need that ability to do that, do it with confidence, conviction, etc. We look at our game video, we make a decision. I think I got the call right. I think I got the call wrong. Here's why. Here's the factors that led to that, etc. I'm going to take that. I'm going to get better. Keep getting better. Keep improving. A constant cycle of improvement going forward. And I appreciate that play being submitted and... Now, we're going to move to a bonus play from Mike Connors. Let's take a look. Oh, boy, that is hilarious. It's hilarious every time I see it. Right? You first watch the play. You're looking for something at the basket. Something comes flying onto the court. What is it? <laughs> All right. So that's super fun. Uh, a super fun play. <laughs> oh, boy. Right. Now, obviously, we have a dead ball situation. Right. Dead ball situation. The game is interrupted. Right. That's got to be something. Right. This is just, uh, you know, the kids can run on the floor. A ball can come in from a player standing for the next game, ready to come in. Stuff happens in the game. This is obviously inadvertent. Uh, if this was... Uh, a player throwing, a coach throwing a shoe in disgust, it would be something different. But it's one of the things that happens in the game. It's a lot of fun when when things like this happen. And it's a funny moment, especially if we perceive it. It's easy to see on video. If we're the lead official here, we might not have any idea how that shoe got on the court. I think our trail official has a look at the play. One more time. Let's take a look. She's into it. Yeah, baby. Whoop. <laughs> and of course, the player's reaction when they're, oh, <laughs> it's hilarious as well. All right. Thanks, Mike, for submitting that. It uh, gave me a laugh and really put a bow on it. Put a bow on the episode. Thanks for joining us today for Five Play Friday. Appreciate you sticking around to the end of the video. Now would be a great time if this is the vi video content that you find valuable to do all of the things, to hit the like and subscribe and notify so you don't miss out 
on any of our new content. We live stream twice a week, every Wednesday and Friday. Join the live stream, jump in the chat, put your voice in the game so we can all get better together. Do allow me a moment to thank our tremendous show supporters, Janice Brown, Jeff Jewett, Gary Mouton, Ashton Dillon, and Richard Hill. Much appreciated and much love. You want to support the show? You know you can buy us a coffee. I'll put a link up above and a link in the show notes below. Tremendous additional video content available here. I've made this choice. YouTube says this is the one to watch. You make your choice. And we'll see you in the very next video. Take care.